it just hits me so strong in the heart. And I distinctly remember typing it and be like, whoa, I have to step back and pause because what they just said was so important and so wise. And I know it didn't come from me. <laughs> and so. Ladies and gentlemen, you see it hinter mir Einstein, Sokrates, Leonardo da Vinci and John Strelecki. I finde, das ist eine sehr, sehr gute Wahl und das passt exzellent zusammen. Ich freue mich sehr, dass du da bist. Dear John, welcome. Thank you. I'm here. Uh, that's uh, quite a collection of, of philosophers you have there. I'm honored to be even in the company of that, plus yeah. you. Yeah, and I said, like, uh, so now nobody's missing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> now you're here. Right. John, you are doing the travel in Europe right now, especially in Germany, the biggest part of it. Yeah. How do you feel? What day is it today? Uh, that is a good question. I think we're on day 10 and uh, the tour is going great. We just finished uh, uh, the Dresden stop, then made our way to Erfurt, and now we're heading here for our Cologne event tonight. And uh, yeah, it's been awesome. The chance to see fans, interact with fans, you know, it's been two and a half years because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's great to be back. Wow, I can feel you so much because uh, I've done also my workshop uh, last two weekends. Uh, meeting the people and this is an amazing feeling to see the faces now yeah yeah it's funny because you you have a sense of how much you miss and then when you actually go back to it you really really realize how much you miss it wow so, yeah happy to be here so you you've done to uh, Erfurt yeah in the more other part from Germany now yeah. you've come to Cologne uh, is there any spots or any cities where you want to go more or is it already done the tour oh no totally yeah so we leave cologne and we'll go to zurich in switzerland and then we have three more stops in germany and i wish that i actually had more time in each stop because you know you get to a city and like some days we literally arrive and that the event is that night and then we get up the next morning and we head back on the bus and uh, so yeah i mean every place has something special so we uh, had a great time so far uh, but i can see that in the future we're going to book in a little extra time in each location so yeah so wow um, john book number four of the series das café am rande der welt and it's called überraschung im café am rande der welt yeah how does it uh, meant überraschung why surprise so in this case uh there's something very interesting for readers and in that the character of john is not in this book mm -hmm. and so we have a main character who is 15 years old her name is hannah and readers who had read the third book in the series got to know Hannah a little bit. And when I originally wrote that book, I thought it would be Hannah and John, Hannah wanting to be older at 15, John wishing he was younger. And then as I went through the writing process, I realized that the story of Hannah was something very, very special and it deserved to have its own full book. And so this is really all about this young, young kid and what she's going through and the challenges she faces. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it was such a pleasure to write it. Uh, it the Why story especially? Yes. Well, I think in part my own daughter is about to be 15. So mm -hmm. uh, I was thinking very much like what are the pieces of life wisdom that I wish I'd have known when I was 15. Uh, you know, I mean, better to learn it at 50 or 55 or whenever, but I wish I would have known at 15. And uh, so there was definitely a piece of that. And my daughter was actually one of the focus group readers for me. So when I finish a book, I have 10 people read it and give me really critical feedback. And I asked her if she would be one of the 10 for this book, and she did. So that was an awesome experience as a dad. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And it's called Eine Erzählung von Suchen und Finden. So about seeking and finding. Yeah. What exactly has to be found or... You know, this, this young kid is, uh, like I said, she's 15 years old. She, she's growing up in a very challenging home environment. Um, her parents are not supportive. So she's really on her own. And what's interesting about life is, and you and I have talked about this in offline discussions and everything else, but you arrive on the planet and you enter this human form and there's no owner's manual. You know, there's no like, okay, here's how you play the game of life. Here's how you win. <laughs> And the best we can do is to try and figure it out. Sometimes we get inspiration through books. Sometimes it's through a conversation. Sometimes it's just through a moment where we have a flash of insight. Uh, but in her case, Hannah, she really does not have a lot of resources. And she's on the verge of losing hope, which is why she and the cafe have crossed paths at this moment in her story. Wow. You said uh, when you was writing it down, it was like a, a kind of flow. Totally. Kind of, yeah. 
when does it begin? You know, I don't write on demand, so I don't say to myself, oh, it's been a year, I should write a book. I very much wait until something inside of me says there's a story. And then I will start capturing my thoughts and my ideas, and I'll do that for two months probably, just storing them in a file. And then there comes one day when I just know it's time. And I often go to a park, a nice nature environment, and I'll just sit all by myself. And I read through all of the ideas that were coming to me over the previous months. And then I start writing the story. And when I say I start writing the story, it's honestly like I enter that cafe and I see it taking place in front of me and I hear the characters and it's as much can I get it down as fast as they're talking. And uh, so, yeah, there were many things in this book that surprised me, which you would think, oh, that's kind of odd, right? You're writing the story. Um, but especially the ending, which I don't want to spoil for anybody, but the ending really surprised me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So it, it was like your own movie when you was hearing the stories without knowing how it will end? Totally. Wow. Totally. <laughs> I mean, how was it for you? You wrote this amazing book that's doing so fantastic. Uh, do, do you find that same thing? Does it, does it flow through you? Do you think ahead before you write? What's your process? Uh, it's an amazing question because uh, you are a big big master in, in writing books which touch millions and it, it's kind of same but I, it took me about 20 years to write this one and the last three to six months I sent everybody out of the house and said <laughs> this guys please <laughs> la leave me quiet on this same area where John is right now here big pleasure and somehow still of all these pieces it was like w where does it come from yeah, yeah. And this is exactly the books uh, which touch how was it for you to get this all the feedbacks Maybe you said, I asked 10 people to give me critics because yeah. if you channel something from another world, then you get the, like a human brain critics. Right. How, right. how does it work? Well, so the key thing for me when we, as writers, one of the things I think about all the time is that it, it's important that it makes sense to me and that I love it because I need to believe in, in the stuff that's on the paper. That said, sometimes we're so familiar with an idea that when we explain it, we think we're explaining it good enough that everyone will know what we're saying. But sometimes, because we've been thinking about it for so long, it's clear to us, but it isn't clear in the way we explain it. So I realize that it's really important to get that exterior perspective to see, does it come across in the way that the reader will understand and connect with? Uh, so when I ask the 10 people, if one person says, oh, I'm not sure about this, that's okay for me, that's just one person. But if four of the 10 say, I didn't really understand what you were trying to do here, then I know I need to go back and I need to rework it. So it's about explanation of all this uh, wisdom and, and, and things which comes through you. Yeah, because we all have our own filters. You yes. know, if, if I hear something and then my life experience has a relation to that, maybe I look at that moment one way, but maybe the reader doesn't have that same relation. Maybe they've got a different one. And so again, it's just really important to me Because as an author, you only have one shot. You know, you can't go out there and say, okay, after the first 10,000 copies, let me know how you thought and I'll go back and rework it. it it's too late. Yes. Uh, it's important that when you release it, it's everything that it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. You know what I think uh, the, the, the biggest magic you have, um, because now I feel it through your eyes because now it's offline event, the third time we speak. Um, I think your biggest gift or maybe one of your biggest gifts are that you you get this idea and you can bring it crystal clear to this planet and not to changing it too much but to changing at least so much that you get to all these people and that this this is the big uh, difference between John and all the millions probably authors and writers um, to get the message done without filtering too much but not to get changed too much right well I appreciate it I mean I very much think that I get to be the steward of the cafe stories um, way more than I am the author of the stories. Because very, very many times in the process of writing, the characters will say something and I type it down and I, I have to step back and pause because what they just said was so important and so wise and I know it didn't come from me. <laughs> and so it's really important to me that when that moment happens that I honor it for exactly what it is. And I'll definitely have moments like that. There's, there's some special conversations in this book from lots of different characters, but Max and Hannah in particular have some discussions and dialogues. And some of the lines, honestly, 
it just hits me so strong in the heart. And I distinctly remember typing it and being like, whoa, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. like, I know that is going to be something that connects with people because it totally connects with me. So if you feel it, do, do you feel it in your whole body, this process of, of truth? Yeah, yeah. Could, yeah. You, could you say like people who are like solving different uh, problems in their life right now, somebody like uh, marriage problems, somebody at his job, you feel the truth within your body? Yeah, I 100% believe that. Your unconscious mind is so in tune with not just what's going on with you physiologically, but what it is that you most want in your life. Uh, the paths of your, you know, the options that you're considering, which one of those paths is the one that's most going to get you there. I am blown away, fascinated by this because I use it in sport. You know, I, I still actively play beach volleyball. And what I find is that this is like a muscle. Um, and the more you develop fluency with the muscle, the more the muscle will want to talk to you. You know, it's, it's kind of like, If you were speaking to me in uh, Spanish and I, you asked me 10 questions and I never listened and I never responded, at some point you'd get bored of having that dialogue. But if you asked me 10 questions in Spanish and I answered two of the 10 this week and next week I answered four of the 10, you'd be more motivated to, and I think that's the way it works with our unconscious mind, that as we demonstrate, I'm listening, And as we demonstrate, I'm putting into action what I'm hearing from you, then the unconscious goes, oh, great. Now we have a real dialogue going and I'll feed you even more information. And so in the sports world, I will literally see my opponent turn to go back to the service line. And I will know, I'll get a ping, like they're going to serve right to left and it's come to come and break to the service line. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell, it's, it's always right. Like, so learning to trust that, I wish I'd have known that back in the day when I was, you know, 25 and playing sports. Mm -hmm. But we all have that within us, whether you're making decisions about your relationships, whether you're deciding on jobs, whether you're thinking about an adventure you want to go on. Yeah, if you can tap into that, that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. And with, you, with your books, you give a big, big, big um, solution to the people, but also uh, you're a great inspirator, as in Germany you say, Inspirator, I don't know how, how you call it in English. Uh, inspirational or yeah. Yeah, but as su substantive, whatever. <laughs> but this guy here, uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, close to Leo between Leonardo and Socrates, uh, he said something like, uh, you express yourself right now. He said, there's just one this moment when you get your um, ideas and when they come to this material world, it let... Uh, a person or a man or woman forget anything like dreaming, sleeping, eating, mm. and you describe this process really emotional. Yeah. Does it need to get to get crystal clear within your uh, feelings, emotions, or does it need empathy to to bring this to this planet? Because a lot of people would say, "Well, I sit there, nothing happens. <laughs> then I eat my donuts, then I drink my wine, nothing happens." Right. Right. I think, like I said, it's it's fluency, and so it's learning in small little baby steps sometimes. Sometimes it's a huge thing. You know, I've heard of different authors. Eckhart Tolle talks about this when he wrote A New Earth, that it was just a massive flash, and he knew that this is what I'm supposed to be focusing on. So I think it can come in that way, but I also think that it can be a slow process where you start to build that fluency. So for example, If your mind is saying to you, you're forgetting something, to stop in that moment and just pause and have a little mental dialogue, well, what am I forgetting? As opposed to what, you know, in the past I've done, you get in your car, you start driving away, and then you remember. Those are small little examples. Or uh, let's say that you are doing something, and sports is such a good analogy because you get sort of immediate feedback on that. And so if you're doing something in sport, and you get a sense that the course of action is to go left, but logically you feel, no, I should go right. And you go right, and then in the second you're like, oh, totally should have gone left. <laughs> you only need three or four of those to realize, wow, there's, there's something happening here. Uh, so I think that's it. It's allowing yourself to take small moments of your everyday and build upon that and then start applying it to the bigger stuff. But you can ask yourself the basic question, not basic because it's less important, but why am I here? And go for a walk in the woods and do that for seven days in a row, just quiet, no distractions, and see what pops up over the course of the seven days. And my guess is it's going to be something interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
And this wonderful new book is Discovering Three Questions. Can you bring us these three questions? Yeah, so Hannah, well, obviously each person who goes into the cafe discovers different questions on their menu. And so for Hannah, she discovers the question, who am I? Um, at first it stated, who are you? But then it morphs on the cafe, just like it did for John, who am I? And that's such an interesting and powerful question. Because what Hannah learns is that it's not about where I live, it's not about what clothing I wear, it's a much bigger question. And the cool thing that she discovers is that she actually gets to choose. Mm -hmm. Now this is something that it took me decades to figure out, that we actually get to choose our stuff. But for Hannah, that's one of the first things she discovers. The second question is, where will you be from? Mm -hmm. You know, very often in life we think about, well, where am I going? And what are my goals? What am I striving for? And I'm very much about that with the Big Five for Life. But this question of where will you be from is very, very fascinating because in order for us to go from here to there, almost every single time, it's important for us to leave something behind. And so where will you be from energetically? Which belief systems will you leave behind so that you can adopt a new one? Where will you be from in your job? What will you leave behind so that you can go do the dream job? Uh, and so I love this question and I love that she encounters it at such a young age because she grows up in such a tough environment. Mm -hmm. And if she's going to transition to something better, she's going to have to leave behind some belief systems about who she is. And then her last question is actually the first question that John discovered on the cafe menu. Why are you here? Mm -hmm. Did you discover your, uh, why am I here? I, at what I mean, age? Yeah, well, I mean, it definitely came about following my adventures of backpacking around the world. So I cemented in my mind that at my core, I am an adventurer. Mm -hmm. That is what I live for. And it could be the adventures you have with your kids as a parent. It could be the adventures you go on because you love being in the outdoors. But I love to do different things, see different things, experience new realities. And so for me, that's a huge piece of it. In conjunction with that, my purpose on the planet, I believe, is to create museum day moments for myself and for others. And so that's something from the Big Five for Life book. And uh, yeah, it's morphed over time. I've perfected it over time in terms of the, the language of it. But right now, that's really what it feels like. Hmm. If you ask um, to, to the sky or to all this spiritual world, uh, what is the plan with all of these books? Are they saying like, John, Keep cool, you're now at number four, still <laughs> six are to come, or what is the plan? Do you feel something like they're, it's communicating to you already? Yeah, I, so I really thought, honestly, that when I was working on this one, that it would be the potentially the last one in the cafe series because it kind of closes the loop. You know, we have a young protagonist at 15, mm -hmm. then you have the first book in the series, John is 28. The second book, we meet Jessica, who's 35, mm -hmm. and then John, who's 50 in the third book. And I thought, oh, that kind of closes the arc. But I will tell you <laughs> that in the process of writing it, I distinctly remember I was in the park all by myself, and I was writing, and I paused for just a second, and I had the thought, where did Casey come from? Mm -hmm. And I thought, wow, like that's a whole story in and of itself. Casey's story. How did she get to be so wise? How did she discover the cafe in the first place? How did she and Mike meet? And so I'm not saying I'm 100% sure that it will be another book in the series, but I think there's a very interesting story to be told there. So I, I maybe am sure. someday. I am sure. Yeah. How about you? So you, your uh, well, book obviously no. is doing fantastic. You said it took you 20 years of thinking about it and six months to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. when you put a little bit your your neck on the side, the people maybe know what we're speaking about. It's, exactly. it's right back yeah, here. So yeah, here. exactly. Right uh, well, there there is no plan. There we go. Now we <laughs> no, can see it. <laughs> it just like just, just breeze and let, let me let me go with this book. It, it was a lot of work, so I appreciate so much um, about all your knowledge. And in the part two, uh, we will ask. Uh, we will question, no, we will answer the questions of you guys uh, to John because I received about 8,000 uh, questions. <laughs> yeah, we saw a lot yeah. of questions. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, so see you in part number two. All right, part two. Du willst mehr Möglichkeiten? Trainiere deine Fähigkeiten. Und zwar mit meinem nagelneuen Spiegel Bestseller Platz 1 Buch Soulmaster. Es beinhaltet diverse Lebensbereiche und hat mich über 20 Jahre lang recherchieren und bündeln gekostet, damit du es leicht verständlich auf den Punkt bekommst, inklusive einen Videokurs im Wert von 200 Euro mit dazu. Hier kannst du es dir direkt holen. Okay.